want to welcome you as well in the name of the Lord. And we just believe that God has something so, so, so good in store for you today. I do uh, want to uh, give you an announcement that I've been really excited about for some time. Uh, As we go into fall, as we go into this next season, we're going to add a third worship experience. And so we're moving... We're moving to three services um, in the middle of uh, September. September 18th, I believe, was the date. So we'll be at 9 a.m., 11 a.m., and then 6 p.m. And so if you've been part of Sunday Night Revivals in the past, uh, you know it's like God just moves in some kind of way. And I've been threatening to do this for some time. I was like, we're, just, we're gonna do this every week. And then people would ask me, we're we gonna do this every week? And I was like, I, we might do this every week. And so announcement, we're gonna do it every week. And uh, so it, it's, it's gonna be... It's going to be like the same but different. We're, we're going to have, there's absolutely no clock on Sunday night. We'll have extended worship and uh, lots of uh, powerful ministry moments. We're believing that the Holy Spirit will show up and uh, God will do what only God can do. So um, I, I would say this, you know, as we go into fall, uh, God is adding to the house and we're giving you more room to keep inviting and keep making it loud. Uh, but even for yourself, you know, you might show up at 9 or 11 and I'm going to call it the circle back six because come on, if, you, if you're still hungry... You can circle back to the six and continue to receive from God and continue to minister to the Lord. And um, it's going to be, it's just going to be all time. This next season is going to be the best season. With Jesus, it just keeps getting better. It really does. And I I do want to say hello. If I haven't met you, my name is Aaron. And along with um, my gorgeous, beautiful, amazing wife, we're we're the pastors around here. And I'm the preacher. I get to preach to you today. And I'm going to minister to you. I am fired up. I really am. I felt like God was speaking to me this week. And and I've got something that that just feels sort of, just sort of tailor-made, custom-built, you know, made just for you. And um, I don't know. I just, I don't know. I'm just in a good mood. Can I do that? I mean, I mean, sometimes I do it because it's like, okay, God, you called me. Sometimes I do it because it's like, okay, God, they're paying me. But I mean, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. But I, I, just, I just feel the, I, I don't know, I just feel the favor of God. I feel the hand of God. And uh, I want to say the favor that's on this house is, is, is a favor for your house. And um, I want you to get all of this. And Jesus just loves you so much. And... Uh, Let's get into it. Why not? Grab your Bible, open up your phone, and uh, get situated. And, and by the way, uh, we, got some, we got some new seats, so nobody gets the bad seats anymore. Come on, let's celebrate. And we, we hope that you, you know, as you came in today, you just feel um, appreciated and loved and served and, and just really welcomed into this house. But really above and beyond all of that. Um, I, I know you can sit up in church for a long time, but, but the difference maker is always an encounter with God, is always a meeting with God. And so the way that we've been praying is that, that you would meet with Jesus. Um, and uh, because of that, because you, you walk away saying, surely the presence of the Lord was in that place, well, you'd never be the same. You'd be a different person. And um, so, okay, we are in uh, week eight now of Made for Revival, Made for Revival, the series that we've been in uh, through the better part of the summer. And, you know, one way to get a sense of what God is about to do is, of course, to look back at what God has already done. Because we have a God that's the same yesterday, today, and forever. But I don't want to get overly hung up on what God has already done because what God is getting ready to do is going to supersede what God has already done. Here's why, because God's the same yesterday, today, and forever. God doesn't change, but at the same time, God is doing something new. God is doing something fresh. God always saves the best wine for last. God is always bringing us from glory to glory to glory. Can I get a good amen in church today? And we're just believing that we are in the best of days. I've just had this increasing sense of feeling privileged to be alive and breathing and on the planet and called to do this at this time in this city uh, in recent months and years. And, and we just see that we're coming in, we're already feeling it now, but we're coming into a great move of God that I believe is going to usher many thousands uh, out of darkness into light and is really just going to leave the, the, the planet changed forever. And the fact of the matter is, is we weren't made for anything else but revival. We were made for revival. Now, one revivalist I wanted to mention 
uh, is John Wimber. And it took me a little while to get here, but I love John Wimber and have spent time um, reading over, uh, you know, the sermons and, and some of the books of, uh, that, John, that John Wimber had written. Uh, was a powerful preacher, had a ministry of healing, signs and wonders, uh, was the founder of what's now known as the Vineyard Church. And, um, you know, just as an anecdotal story, something I came across actually in another author's book, uh, said, hey, you know, one time I was in my office and, and John Wimber happened to stop in, was in town, I think, preaching, whatever. We were chatting, talking about ministry, talking about church, and uh, this particular preacher had an, an assistant, and they said, hey, you know, I know my assistant, Bill, they, they would just love to meet John Wimber. They, Wimber was very well known at this point. It was sometime in the late 80s. And so it's like, hey, Bill, come on in. And so the assistant, Bill, walks into the office, and, and as soon as Wimber shakes Bill's hand, says, hey, uh, you've got two kids, and their names are names, names off the kids, and then says, this is what's been going on in their life, and this is what's about to go on in their life. And I mean, is, is, is there anything like God literally calling you out by name to establish faith in you for what God wants to do next? And, and so Wimber was well known for, you know, calling, you know, prophesying over people and calling people out by name. And, and, and let me just say that the Spirit of God knows you by your name. And um, there's what Wimber one time said, and I want to sort of build off of this, and, and I'm going to kind of I'm going to be all over the place today. Is it all right if we do a little bit of a Bible study? And, and um, here's what Wimber said. Only Bible, and we dry up. Only spirit, and we blow up. But Bible and spirit, and we grow up. I like that. I like that. I like that. So let me grab one verse to um, get us going here. 2 Peter 3 and verse 17. I've got... Uh, Somewhat unusual translation. I'm going to read this from. I love how it's brought out the contemporary English version. So if it looks a little different in yours, that's why. Second Peter 3.17 says, My dear friends, you have been warned ahead of time. So don't let the errors of evil people lead you down the wrong path. And here's what I want to key in on. And make you lose your balance. Don't let evil people surround you, push you around and throw you out of balance, make you lose your balance. I wanna preach to you today from the subject, the blessing of balance. The blessing of balance. The blessing of balance. I wanna work from the idea that in many ways, a balanced life is a blessed life. That's the essence of what Wimber was saying. Only Bible gonna dry up, only spirit gonna blow up. We, we need both in our, in our spiritual life. What Wimber was saying was, was there is a blessing in our spiritual life when we are walking in a sense of balance, a balance. There's, I would say for somebody today, there's a breakthrough as you find your balance. Because without balance, something good can become something bad. Without balance, something that would otherwise help you can end up hurting you. Uh, for example, we need a few days, all of us, no matter how great of a work ethic you might have, we all need a few days every once in a while to clock out, to go on vacation, to, to grab your wife, to get your spouse and, and find yourself in Cancun and to shut off your phone and, and to play a little bit of golf. And, and, and every once in a while, we need to go on vacation. But how many know that you need to balance some work and rest and some rest and work because if you, if you only have vacation, pretty soon the hotel manager is going to show up when you stop paying your bill and say, either you're going to wash some dishes or you got to go back home. There, there's, there's a blessing in balance. I'm, 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 you know, let, let, let's take it to our diet, for example. Um, I've heard that carrots are good for you. I don't personally eat carrots. I don't like carrots. I don't like the color of carrots. I don't like the texture of carrots. I don't like the taste of carrots. I don't care if you cook them and you got your special sauce on them. I still don't want your carrots. If you have room for dinner, I don't want carrots. But I've heard carrots are good for you. But I, I would be willing to also bet that if all you ate was carrots, eventually you would turn orange and you would look like an Oompa Loompa. And you'd have to be employed by Willy Wonka. How else could you find a job? It's making logical connections for you. And, and, and I'm, 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 being, I'm being funny about it. I'm being cute about it. But I mean, let, let's, let's get kind of real about it. How about this? 
the blessing of balance. Um, you, you need to spend time with your family and with your spouse and with those people that are close to you. Um, you can't be at work all the time or your family would be neglected. But if all you have is time with your family, eventually your family's gonna look at you and say, we need some food, you need to go back to work. You get what I'm saying? That, that there's a blessing in, in, that, that, that only comes with, with, with balance and, and we're gonna be living in frustration until we found it. I mean, let me put it this way. Christ is the solid rock upon which we stand. But although we might have a solid surface, if we don't have our balance, we're still gonna get shoved around when the devil gets up in our business, even though the surface we're standing on is solid. We need the breakthrough of what it is to have balance. There's a balance, there's, there's a balance. When I was praying the other day, I asked the Lord, Look, you know, how do we get our balance? And, and you, know what I, you know what I felt like I heard from God? I was asking God, how do we get our balance? I felt like God told me, try Google. <laughs> and so, you know, I, I wonder sometimes if, if, if it's like, I don't know, may, maybe your perception is that I'm like, I, I have like this moment in the week where I'm like, you know, all of a sudden, like a, a, a bright light shines on me and then I look down and my sermon notes are on my iPad. It doesn't work that way. It, in order for God to work through me, I gotta work for it. You know what I'm saying? So God said, try Google. Your fingers ain't broke, Google it. And you, you, know, what, you know what I found out? Um, this was some, it was like something that I knew but, but didn't really know, and, and, and maybe you're the same way. Um, our entire sense of balance, watch this, happens through the function of our inner ear. I read all about it. I was really interested in it. I'm, I'm, I'm an expert in the system of the inner ear. If you have any questions about the biology of the inner ear, you just go ahead and ask me. For example, there's three semicircular canals called the anterior, posterior, and lateral. <laughs> I thought maybe you'd be impressed by that. So it, it works actually a lot like, you know how your iPhone knows which direction it's in? You know when you pick it up, it comes on? Uh, it, it's the same way with, with, with these three canals in your inner ear that there's a fluid in these canals and, and when you turn, you know, you, you, you move your head up and down, one canal responds or, or when you go like this to say no, another responds. When you go like this, an, a, another responds. And this is how we get our sense of balance. It, it, it's a working of the inner ear. So watch me now. Our balance will fail if our inner ear isn't fully Functioning, and, and I hope you're picking up on the spiritual connotation that I'm trying to preach because it's not just about what you're hearing, it's about how you're hearing it. It's possible, watch me, it's possible to hear the right voice but to hear it the wrong kind of way. Did you know you can be so messed up in your inner ear in, in the way that you're hearing that somebody can try and give you a genuine compliment but you hear it as a criticism? Why? Because you're all out of balance, because, because everything is skewed, because everything seems to be spinning. You can hear something that is absolute facts, but the way you're hearing it can be so skewed that it might as well be false. And when your inner ear is bad, you'll have a lost sense of balance. And Jesus came along and said to the Pharisees, you have ears, but you do not hear. What was Jesus preaching to them about? Your inner ear isn't functioning. You're hearing, but you're not hearing. What was the problem of the Pharisees? You could say, you could sum it up in a sentence. The Pharisees were out of balance. They had all law, but had no understanding of God's love. They had all rules, but no relationship. But hey, but you need balance. I get worried sometimes. I, I'll, I'll get to talking with a believer and they're, ah, oh, just... I'm just, just relationship, it's just there's no rules, it's grace, it's relationship. You need some rules, the same as my kids needed some rules so that they didn't run into the road. Hello, hello, can I preach this like I really wanna preach it? I came to minister to psych, I didn't, I didn't come for applause, I came to help you. And, and, and so they were out of balance. And, and Jesus says, it's not just what you hear, but it's, but it's how you hear. And, and you might be, feeling like you're stumbling or falling because your, your inner ear, how you're hearing is, is misfunctioning. And it's difficult to walk by faith when our inner ear, our balance isn't functioning. After all, Romans 10 tells me that faith comes by what? 
hearing, hearing. So, so if my ability to hear is broken, I'll have no balance and therefore can't walk by faith because people are losing their balance and trying to walk by faith and trying to stay up, but I feel like I'm gonna fall. How, let me ask this, how can you run into your victory if you're suffering from spiritual vertigo? Anybody ever had vertigo? It will mess you up. So some years ago, I was getting ready to go on a ministry trip to South America, to Santiago, Chile, and I had a few friends that were gonna accompany me and come with me and help me out, preaching in about 10 or 12 churches, and as we were getting ready to go and getting ready to fly, uh, the problem became that, that the one friend uh, had a horrible case of vertigo. It was so bad that they would try and stand up, they would fall back down. And how many know you don't want that kind of vertigo when you're getting ready to get on a plane for 15 hours? Hello, hashtag somebody passed the barf bag, right? Like, that's not a good situation. And so my friend, they... They had more faith than I did, and they said, hey, look, I can't come to you because if I get in my car, that's not going to go well, so you got to get in your car, and you got to come to me. But if you'll come over to my house, I want you to lay hands on me and pray for me, and I believe God's going to heal me. I'm going to go on this trip. And I was like, you sure? <laughs> did you check about the refund? Like, I had no faith. And, and so I went over, I did it anyway, and, and I, just, just as an aside, you can function by faith even though you're not feeling faith. We put way too much stock on the way we feel. Maybe God's not as interested in your feelings as the fact that you're functioning in faith. And so, hey, I, I went over and, and I just prayed a simple prayer. I said, Jesus, you're a healer. Heal him in Jesus' name. And, and to my surprise, this friend stood up. He said, you know what? I'm feeling, I'm feeling good. And then they, they got to like pacing around their living room. And they're like, I'm healed. I'm going on, oh, I'm going on the trip. To, and they went on the trip and they helped me and they ministered with me. And, and, I, and I'm just trying to point out the fact that you're never going to be able to walk into your victory if you're still suffering from that spiritual vertigo. And I believe that the Spirit of God is in this house today to bring healing to someone's inner ear, that you might get the breakthrough of having your balance back. Somebody shout amen. So, so let's do a little work now because... Because I'm, I'm going to try and I'm trying to balance everything I'm saying with some biblical balance. How does, how does the Bible um, speak to us about balance? Well, well, here's one way, and I'm going to show you uh, with several examples. When it comes to balance, we, we, need to, we need to get into the area of having the right, uh, you can write this down if, if you're taking notes. We need the right proportions. We have to have balanced proportions. Or I could preach it like this. We need balanced percentages. I went a while back to get some to get some fried rice here in downtown Coeur d'Alene. And I'm not gonna say what restaurant it was because I'm about to speak very di disparagingly about this restaurant. And you know, somebody might work at that restaurant and be here today or maybe you own that restaurant and then I don't, I don't wanna you know, speak death when there could be life. You might get better at cooking <laughs> at some point in the near. <laughs> but so me and the kids, we went and I got some fried rice and I took, you know, three, maybe five bites. Have you, ever, have you ever had so much salt on something that it was like, it didn't just taste bad, it was like, it was burning? It was like, the, the inside of my throat, it's like, it's melting? Like, I, maybe we should go and check into the ER because of those last five bites that I had. And so, you know, I was kind of getting ready to, okay, I need to, I need to find somebody about this. And, and I looked, there was kind of like an open kitchen. I looked over the bar where all the, where all the, chefs were, and they were all like 13 years old. <laughs> and so I just threw it away, and I said, come on, let's, let's go get some McDonald's or something. This ain't going, this ain't going to work. What, what I'm trying to say is, is, is a little bit of salt would have been great, but then a whole lot of salt is really gross. Unbalanced proportions right away are going to become a problem. But watch me. Balanced proportions can be so powerful. Um, here's an example. In your spiritual life, if you're gonna walk into God's promises, here's a place you gotta find the right proportions. You need the right proportions of celebration and anticipation. The psalmist came along and said, praise the Lord. Praise God in the sanctuary. 
Praise God in the mighty heavens. Praise God for all the mighty deeds. Praise God according to his excellent greatness. We need a celebration. We need to stop declining our invitation to the praise party. We need to remember what it is to celebrate the goodness of God and to get our praise on. I think something's happened sometimes in the body of Christ, in the church, sometimes up on a Sunday. You, you, you'll look around and, and you'll say to yourself, well, the, the most spiritual person is the one that when it gets kind of quiet and it's real kind of like there's, there's like a ton of haze and, and the band's doing something real slow and the synthesizer's playing and they're the ones that are like this and they've got the tear running down. Yeah, that's great, but sometimes the most spiritual person in the room is the one that when the drums are kicking and when they didn't feel like it because they're going through hell that week, but they showed up in God's presence anyway and decided to praise, and they're singing in their out-of-tune voice, and they're dancing even though they look like a dork, but they don't care because it's not about the people around them. It's about the presence of God within them, and I'm telling you there's something so powerful about remembering to praise. The praise. We need celebration, but we also need anticipation. Because Micah, the prophet, said, but as for me, I will look to the Lord. I will wait for the God of my salvation. My God will hear me. I'm, I don't know about you. I'm anticipating right now the fulfillment of some more promises of God. I, I'm anticipating, my faith tells me that this ain't it. I've got a hope down deep that God put in my spirit that says, there is more. I've got some anticipation for God to touch my life in some ways and bring healing to some places that are still hurting. I don't know about you, but I've got some anticipation. I'm waiting for God's promise to show up in my life any minute, kind of like you've been waiting for that Amazon package. You've been checking the tracking every 15 seconds. That's how I feel about God's promise, showing up at my door. But here's where we gotta get balanced. If I have all anticipation but no celebration, I'll remember God has a promise, but I'll forget to praise. But if I've got all celebration, no anticipation, I might get my praise on, but I'll forget God has a greater promise. And here's what I've discovered. My ability to celebrate strengthens me with the faith I'm gonna need to anticipate. And as I anticipate, now I get a fresh promise. And guess what a fresh promise does? It just gives me another reason to praise. See, there's a breakthrough in balance. Balance proportion. Because, because when I remember what God did, now I got faith for what God is about to do. But I, I in this area, there's, there's times where I need, I need breakthrough to find balance because I got the kind of personality that as soon as like, We've, we've hiked up the mountain, and soon as we've arrived at the peak, as, as soon as we've gotten to the pinnacle, everybody else is cooking a meal. Everybody else is enjoying the view. Everybody else is like, let's take a selfie on top of the mountain, and I'm out there like, I see some more mountains. Anybody, come on, suffer from this? That, that, that as soon as you get there, you're trying to figure out what's, and, and it's like, I gotta get back down to the valley, so I have another climb, and I got. And, and, and I felt like God would say to somebody today, there's a victory that comes when you figure out what it is to enjoy the view. Some of you, you've had some breakthrough this year. Some of you, you come on, you, you didn't pay off all your credit cards, but you paid off three of your seven credit cards. Some of you, you, you get some victory by enjoying the view. Your marriage isn't where you want it to be, but it's not where it used to be. And there's just something about standing on top of the mountain, taking a selfie and saying, look at all that God has done. You see, because if I spend a little bit of time on this peak, now I've got faith for the next peak. Now I'm encouraged for the next promise. Let, 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 me, let me just give you this and, and then I'll move on. Because when I was thinking about this and this, this, this blessing of balance, I thought about the way, you remember when David fought Goliath? Nobody? <laughs> oh my God, we need a Bible lesson. I, we gotta go back to the remedial class. All right, when, when, when David fought Goliath, I'll show, you, I'll show you that David got a breakthrough because David knew balance. 1 Samuel 17, 37, watch this. You're gonna see celebration and anticipation all in the same sentence. Goliath is out there breathing threats. All the warriors are hiding out. Scrawny, skinny teenager shows up. But I got, I got balance. Watch this. The Lord who rescued me from the paw of the lion and the paw of the bear. Celebration. Will rescue, will, will rescue me 
will rescue me from the hand of this Philistine, there's anticipation. See, because I know that somebody here today, you've got a giant standing over you. You've got a giant breathing th- out threats over you. And, and, and if you're looking for the faith it's going to take to fight this faith, th- th- this fight, if you're looking for the courage it's going to take to trust God to do what you need God to do, can I give you some advice via David out on the battlefield, via a teenager that had some balance? You need to look back, and then you need to look ahead again, and it's going to look different this time. You're going to be ready for your breakthrough, because I bet if you think about about it, you've had God deliver you from a few lions. I bet if you think about it, you've had God rescue you from a few bears. And now all of a sudden when you celebrate the bears, now that giant doesn't look so big. I need celebration and anticipation. That's what Wimber was saying. Balance. All Bible, we're going to dry up. All spirit, we're going to blow up. There's just, there's just power in having the right proportions. Because if, if, all you, if all you do is study, if all you do is study and, and, and you're going to exegete and, and you got a hermeneutic and, and you got big books, but if all you do is study and there's no spirit, you know what's going to happen? It's, it's exactly like it was with the Pharisees. They had it up in their head, but they didn't have it in their heart. And they did a lot of study, but there was no spirit. And, and all study and no spirit is going to leave you cold. But here's the flip. All spirit and no study is going to leave you crazy. We know these people. What's that, Lord? Yeah, I'll take the red sauce for my... (laughs) Well, here's what God's telling me to do. That's not in the Bible. And e- either you're messing up or God's messing up and God ain't messing up. Okay, I'm gonna move on before I, before I get myself in more trouble. Finding, I'm, I'm just, I'm trying to preach. Finding proportion is powerful. L- let me give you another place. You know what I hear a lot of people say? I bet you, if I think about it, somebody has probably already said this to me today, just in conversation in the lobby in passing, and there's nothing wrong with saying it. I say it a lot as well. But what I hear a lot of people say is, I'm praying about it. It's good, you need to pray about it. Please pray about it. But you know what I have never heard anybody say? Well, I'm obeying about it. I've never heard anybody say that in my life. And what good is it to pray about it perpetually Can I say it? Prayer that doesn't lead to obedience is almost like a waste of breath. Remember what the preacher said? Those that are forever seeking the will of God will be passed up by those that are doing the will of God. See, all prayer and no action, you'll know where to go, but you won't be moving. But all action and no prayer, you'll be moving, but won't know where to go. I found out that you can move really quickly in the wrong direction. And all you do is speed up yourself to arrive at the wrong place. So I need the blessing of balance. I need to pray about it, but then I need to obey about it. I need to know where to go, and then I need to get up and go. Come on, I feel the spirit of God on that. I need to know where to go, but then I need to get up and go. We need the blessing of balance. We need to understand the power of proportions. We need to understand that there are times where God says, stand still and know that I am God. And there are other times where God looks at us and says, it's time to get moving because I'm God. We we need the right proportion. We need to understand what's God's responsibility, hello, and what's on me. Proverbs 29, 18 tells us that where there's no vision, the people cast off restraint, give themselves to sin, give themselves to, you you know, another translation says where there's no prophetic vision, the people perish. What does that mean? You need to be spiritually, just to have vitality in your spiritual life. You need to be able to look out in hope and with a sense of God's promise into what's next. Tomorrow. But then it's almost confusing because Jesus comes along, Matthew 6, 34, and Jesus says, Don't worry about tomorrow. Tomorrow will worry about itself. 
each day has enough trouble of its own. Jesus is saying, hey, don't, don't get so caught up in what's next that you forget to handle what's going on right now. Well, hold on a minute. I'm getting confused now. Because without thinking about what's next, I'm gonna perish. I wanna perish. But if I don't think about what's now, Jesus came along and said, I'm gonna have problems. A while back, I bought a motorcycle. And don't worry, my wife's into it. Because you ask my wife, she understands the blessing of balance. She said, there is some risk, but here's the reward. You look so sexy on that motorcycle. It's the blessing of balance. You see me around town, Triumph 900, street scrambler. <laughs> but when, you know, when I was getting ready to get this motorcycle, I asked some friends that, that ride bikes, I said, what do I need to be doing? You know, I, I see semi trucks out there. I see, you know, what do I need to be doing? And, and they, they said, well, here's what's really important. You gotta look way out ahead. You got, because, you know, the further out you see something happening, you're, you're, gonna, have more, you're gonna give yourself more time to, to break or to swerve or, you know, to slow down. And they said, so you, you gotta look way out ahead into what might happen next. You know, traffic situations evolving into, okay, I, I need to know, I need to be some moves ahead, several moves ahead and know what's gonna happen next. But then they also said, they also said, make sure and look at what, what you're driving over right now. Like, look out for potholes. You know, look out for like obstructions that are gonna throw you off balance. And so I said, well, which one is it? Should I look out there or should I look down there? You, both. You need, you need to have the ability to look ahead into what's next and to also look at what's happening right now in order to keep your balance. Am I preaching to anybody? Am I, am I talking to anybody? We gotta find the right proportion. I, I, need, I need the breakthrough of balance. I, I need to have my heart anchored in, in, in the promises of God, but I also need my head in what's happening right now today, and that God gave me strength for today, and God gave me enough for today. So I'm gonna look at what's next, but I'm not gonna neglect what's happening right now, and there's a breakthrough in balance. So, so here's another way, though, because I want to be biblically balanced in this message. And, and, and here's another way that the Bible views balance, and it has to do with scales. Scales, you know, like the balancing of scales. Proverbs 16, 11 says, a just balance and scales are the Lord's. A just balance and scales are the Lord's. That means that God knows how to properly set the scale to properly weigh what needs weighed, to assign the correct weight. So if we wanna be like God, we have to know how to set, God knows how to set his scale. We need, we need to know how to set our scale. So, so let me just show you a few passages that have to do with assigning the wrong weight. How about Matthew 23, verse 23? Here, here comes the Pharisees again. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you tithe mint and dill and cumin and have neglected, watch this, the weightier matters of the law, justice, mercy, and faithfulness, these you ought to have done without neglecting the other. What's Jesus saying? You're, you're putting all the weight on what's wrong. It's good to tithe. It's, you need to tithe. It's commanded to tithe, but, but you're giving it all the weight. And, and the problem with the Pharisees is that they were giving all the weight to what was mostly happening on the outside and neglecting to give weight to what would mostly happen on the inside, which is to love justice, mercy, and faithfulness. They were giving weight to what, they, they set their scales to give the most weight to what would be seen. They like showing up in the synagogue and throwing, you know, they, they, they were the person that would have been like, held up the, the wad of 100s before they put it in the plate as it passed by. They, they, were, they were setting their scale they, they were giving weight to what would be seen and, and neglecting what was mostly unseen. And, and Jesus said, how you're giving weight is all wrong. Here's another example, 2 Corinthians 4, 17. For this light and momentary affliction is preparing for us an eternal, what? No, weight of glory. Y'all got it wrong collectively all at the same time. That was incredible. These translations. <laughs> We need, we need to go, 
Go back to the NIV, the North Idaho version. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> this, this trouble that feels so heavy, this problem that's been weighing you down, this issue that's just been, just been on your shoulders, this burden that feels like you can't carry, God says, you gotta reset your scale. That's light compared to the weight of my glory, the weight of my presence, the weight of my promises. You gotta set your scale. I mean, I mean, sometimes, sometimes we get out of balance because we've assigned the wrong weights. Here's an example. Because we're giving so much weight to what they said and not enough weight to what God said. I mean, you gotta make up your mind about what does matter and what doesn't matter. Let me help you today. What they said about you doesn't matter. What God has said over you, that's what does matter. I don't know what they said about you, but here's what God says to you. You're favored. You've been called. I know you by your name. I'm going to make you the head and not the tail. It's with great and precious promises that I'm going to bring you from strength to strength to strength. I don't know what they said about you, but I say you assign the way to what God says to you. You, you remember when, when Samuel the prophet, we talk about David again, and finding some, some, some scales and some balance. When Samuel the prophet came and was ready to call up the next king, was going to anoint the next leader of Israel, you remember how they did the lineup and they called in all the family, all the siblings, but everybody forgot about David and overlooked David and neglected David and, and they all came in from the field and the prophet of the Lord was there. But then, of course, uh, when they all looked over David, God was looking at David. Amen. And, and Samuel finally said, none of these are it. And I'll stay right here until you go and get the one who is it. And the prophet anointed the one that they all ignored. See, there are times that God will anoint what people have ignored. But here, here's what the problem is is sometimes in our life, and I would have preached the whole message for this. Please hear me. If we were David, even when God had selected us, we would still be sitting there thinking about all the people that had rejected us. Why? Because you've assigned the wrong opinions too much weight. What they said, what they didn't say, you gotta get your scale right, because up against what God declares up against what God speaks, up against what God says over you. What they said doesn't matter. That's what our verse says. Don't let the errors of evil people make you lose your balance. And we can end up on the wrong path because we're trying to prove it to people that aren't even paying attention anyway. Let, let, let me give you a lesson that I wish I could just infuse into every junior higher, but the reality is that sometimes we don't really fully graduate from junior high, none of us. Sometimes we're still there. <laughs> junior hires will show up in a room and they, they, will, they will be convinced that everybody in that room is looking at them, is judging them head to toe, looking at what they're wearing. And then as you get a little bit older, sometimes you found, find out that actually nobody's doing any of that. Nobody's actually thinking about you at all because they're so busy thinking about themselves. Yeah. And they're sitting there thinking, maybe they're judging me and maybe they're looking at me. And, me and, 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 and when we assign the opinions of people so much weight, we go through life trying to prove it to people that aren't even paying attention. And, and we do what we do for the approval or, or for, for, the, for the clap of the crowd. But the problem with that is when the crowd stops clapping, then we quit. But there is another way. What, what, what if we assigned weight instead of trying to prove it, we assigned all the weight to doing it because God gave us purpose. We gotta set the scale. We gotta set the scale. What am I gonna do about is what this person thinks of me? And, and it's sitting all, all, have, have you ever sat up all night thinking about what someone said about you or what somebody thinks about you or what they didn't say about you? And, and, and what this person's talking about? What am I gonna do about it? Here's some advice. Don't do anything. In fact, I'm figuring out that your opinion of me is none of my business. 
I got to set my scale and you got to set your scale. Maybe this will minister to somebody. There's probably some people in your life that you have been waiting to feel validated. You've been waiting to feel okay about yourself. You've been waiting to feel confidence until they give you a compliment. Can I tell you something? There are some people in your life that their criticism to you should sound like a compliment. Here's why. Because if they think you're doing it wrong, you must be doing something right. Stop, stop giving it so much weight. What, what they said about you. you know, John 7, 12 says that right, it was right in the middle of Jesus' ministry, right sort of at, at the height, the miracles and, and healing. And, and the Bible says that right in the middle of all that, there was a widespread whispering about Jesus. Our, our, our world, our, our culture is, is just in this state of extreme arrogance where everybody assumes they have the right to comment that, that they have, that they, that they should have an opinion, that they, that they should, that they should post. And, and, and when we, when we put all the weight on people's whispers and none of the weight on God's word, we wonder why am I so out of balance? And, 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 you know, it, it might not be an actual crowd. Sometimes for me, it's like, I've got to deal with an actual crowd but I think all of us have a crowd, sometimes not out here, but sometimes we have a crowd in here. People from our past and people that meant a lot to us, but maybe abandoned us, people that are not even around anymore, people that are not here anymore. And, and, and when, when they didn't say thank you and, and when you, you get to thinking, well, they don't even appreciate me and, and they wouldn't even miss me and, and they don't even know what I bring to this. And we gotta, get, we gotta get the weight off of people's praise and back onto God's purpose. And we gotta stop doing what we do to get a like and we gotta do what we do because we've already been loved. I'm telling you, when you know that God has already approved, then you don't need anybody else. Mm -hmm. God, I'm gonna get alone. I'm gonna hear your voice and your opinion and your purpose, I'm giving it all the weight. I'm gonna worship for you. I'm gonna walk how I walk for you. I'm gonna make the decisions that I'm gonna make for me and my family for you. I'm gonna do my calling for you. I'm gonna love you and it's just for you. We, 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 got, we gotta stop waiting until somebody sees to feel significant. God sees. It's time to reset your scale. God sees. God sees. I'm almost done. Yeah, um, yeah. Come on, help me shut it down. But, but, but you remember um, one, one, one more one more passage of the Bible, and then we'll be done. You you remember when they came back, and Moses had sent them over into the land of Canaan to to spy out the land. They were they were just about ready to to actually possess God's promise. They were going to cross the Jordan. And um, they were, they were gonna take the land and, and Moses said, hey, why don't you go out across, check it out, bring back a report. And there was 12 spies that were sent. And the Bible records that, that 10 came back with a negative report. And, and up to this point, by the way, the entire nation was no doubt full of a sense of, of promise. This is it. This is, what, this is what God spoke to us through the prophets. We're about to possess the promise. But then these spies came back and they said, hey, look, it's crazy over there. Um, th there's giants, people are big, army strong. In, in fact, they even said to them, we look like grasshoppers. Now, now that's crazy because they didn't interview them. How'd they know that? They just assumed. And they said to them, we, we look like grasshoppers. We're gonna get squashed like bugs. And they said, there's gonna be a great fight. And what they did was they put all the weight on the fight and they tipped the scale of an entire nation. And for a generation, they lived in the desert outside of what God wanted to bring them into. Why? Because the scale got unbalanced. But there was two, Joshua and Caleb. And, and oh, I, was, I got excited when, when the Lord gave me this. Joshua and Caleb came back and they said, yes, yeah, true. Like there's, there's some giants and, 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 and there's gonna be an army and, and there's a fight. 
with all that, that's like, that weighs like three pounds. That's how much weight we're gonna give all that. Because you know what the Bible says? That they went and they brought back some fruit from the land of Canaan. And the Bible says that one cluster of grapes, can I say it this way, was so heavy, had so much weight, that it took multiple people to string it up and carry it on a pole. They, they, the, the 10 came back and they said, there's gonna be, there's gonna be a great fight and, it, and, and, and it's gonna be a terrible fight. And they gave all the weight to the fight. But then Joshua and Caleb came around and they said, no, we got something else to put on the scale. Here's the fruit. And they dropped the fruit on the scale. And the fight might weigh three pounds, but the fruit weighs 3,000 pounds. And for somebody, it's time to drop the grapes back on the scale. I know that there's a fight, but it's time to remember the fruit. I know that you're up against it, but it's time to remember a God that is with you in it. It's time to get your scale set again. It's time to put the grapes back down to remember the weightiness of God's glory and promise and goodness. I don't know what you're up against. I don't know how big it is. I don't know how much it weighs, but I know God's word always weighs more. Come on, shout amen if you believe it. God's promises always outweigh the problems. That's what Joshua and Caleb were trying to show them. Look at these grapes. It's God's promise. It always outweighs the problem. And you know, I, I, don't, I don't know. I don't know how you might picture, but I'm thinking about God's scale. I'm thinking about my scale and we've all got a scale. Here's how I picture it because sometimes the problem, it just feels like it's on you. Have you ever had a problem? It's just like, it's just sitting on you. It's sitting on your chest. It's just sitting on your, on your heart. It's sitting in your, it's just sitting on you. And, and I felt like God showed it to me like this, this weighty problem, just weighing you down. But then when you assign the right weight to God's promise, here's what happens. Prom, the, the problem gets lifted up off of your chest. It's time to give weight back to God's promise. 